take it from there. Um, Daniel Sepulveda is a former uh, ambassador and deputy assistant secretary at the U.S. Department of State. He has two decades of experience at the highest levels of government, including being a senior legislative aide to three United States senators, including then senators Barack Obama and John Kenney. Uh, John Kenney. John Kerry. John Kenney is a good friend of mine. Uh, but it was John Kerry you were working for, right? Yes. Good. And as well as work in civil society. Um, really, really appreciate you being here, Danny. Uh, we had a fantastic discussion a few weeks ago when we showed the full Cuba uh, film uh, that we previewed earlier. So uh, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you for being here, the Family Online Safety Institute for putting this together. I've known Sivan for, for many, many years, uh, and it's exceptionally good work that this organization is doing. So the title of our conversation today is Reclaiming Trust and Civility in Our Challenging World, which is, which is a really large topic. Uh, so there are questions about reclaiming trust between us as citizens and our government, between us as consumers and large companies, and then between us and each other as, as people. So with that, I would, was hoping that each of you could introduce yourselves uh, and let, let people know a little bit about your general thoughts on civility and trust and, and how we can move forward. So starting with Irene. Uh, so my name is Irene Brahm. Um, I'm the executive director of the Bozeman Foundation. And you saw my colleague Samuel George uh, this morning uh, with the Cuba video. Uh, when I think about uh, the topic of trust and civility and how uh, we can restore it. I can only, well, for me, I think, it, you know, it's a joint effort of everybody. I don't think that we um, can expect only from the political leaders to restore trust and, civi and civility. I think uh, it needs to be a commitment from all the different levels, uh, starting also, you know, discussions at school, at home, uh, the way we speak around the table uh, in the evening when we're having dinner together. So it's a commitment of everybody. Great. Hi, I'm Jenny Backus. Uh, I'm a consultant here in DC. I am kind of an, you're a typical and atypical in the sense that I have worked in government. I also worked for John Kerry a long time ago, um, uh, Harry Reid. Um, I've worked in politics. Uh, I worked for Google for many years. Uh, Sarah Holland, who uh, recruited me, who's also, I think, the chair of FOSI right now, and Steve and I got to work with them in, uh, in, in community partnerships. Um, and I just got the privilege of moderating a panel a, a second ago about upstairs about special needs and technology and how technology can open the door for people. So I guess I, in introducing trust and civility, I think um, technology and, and, and families is a really interesting mix because I think technology can help us actually in some ways counterintuitively restore trust and civility because you can, you, it can create communities when you don't have communities, so it's a balance. But I also think in politics right now, it's been definitely exploited um, to, to, to create divisions both here and globally. So it, it is a balance, but um, I take somewhat of a hopeful. I think a lot of it is um, learning how to have conversations with people around the table and, 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 and getting your content interesting and exciting. And I think that was what, to segue off the panel that we just had, yeah, you can present ideas through the medium of technology that can sort of challenge people's behaviors. And, I, and I'm sort of interested in that part of the conversation, too, because I come from the communication space. Okay, hi. I'm Natasha Jackson, and I'm from the GSMA. Um, and if you don't recognize the GSMA, I'm sure you'll recognize our members. We have 850 members who are mobile operators around the world. So in the States, that'll be AT&T and Verizon and Sprint and others, but also all the mobile operators anywhere over in the world who are operating on a mobile network, they're our members. And um, we've been working with our members for over 10 years now on encouraging sort of the safe and responsible use of, of mobile phones and, and internet. Um, and so we've been members um, here at FOSI for, for many years. Um, and I think what we've been seeing is very much that sort of acceptance around the world. And, you know, I'm talking about all parts of the world um, and less developing countries as, as much as well, where people are really accepting and, and really starting to really participate in keeping children safe and thinking about that. So that concept, I think, is very well established. Um, we partner with, along with, with FOSI, we partner with people like Child Help My International to help that. But recently, also, we joined a partnership with UNICEF. And then we started to change a bit the perception of, 
of how we look at this, not just at the protecting online, but also empowering children and making sure that their rights across all the other areas of online are also being encouraged. And I think that's where, for us, trust and civility are coming in there alongside things like promoting policies on digital literacy, on civic engagement, right to privacy, and those sorts of things. And so looking at it in a sort of a wider perspective rather than just the safety perspective. Hi, <coughs> Sven Gurdjieff's, um sorry for the handheld mic. I've been coughing a bit today, but uh, I'm the CTO of Mattel. Um, when it comes to civility, I don't know how you beat the last speaker. Uh, sure. Don't uh, repeat, delete. Um, but from a from a company standpoint, I think Mattel is very focused on how do we create uh, safer play patterns for kids that don't necessarily um, that allow them to play with technology and things that they see their parents interacting with, but structured in a way that's more of a walled garden um, that keeps them protected, that doesn't uh, give them access to the open internet, that gives them uh, physical play as well as digital play experiences. So, trying to um, give them alternatives to necessarily you know open internet play um, on tablets and on devices like that. Sven, it's interesting because Mattel is such an iconic brand. You know, I grew up playing with Mattel toys, and now that I'm a parent, I inherently trust the brand. H how long have you all had a CTO? Is that common among toy? Because I don't think of you as a technology company, so. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I've actually, we've had a CTO for three months. Um, <laughs> How's that going? I, so far, so good. I'm learning a lot. Uh, I'm here, right? Yeah. How could it get any better? Um, now we've had a CTO for three months, and, and Mattel is, is going through a transformation like many companies. Um, and um, I think you know, with new leadership, we recognize that uh, technology and digital uh, is changing the world, it's changing business, and, and we uh, felt like it's a strategic asset that needs to be utilized, it needs to be overseen, and um, not just connected you know, play and, and technology uh, around that, but also the way we run our business and uh, sell and manage our supply chains. And so it's a new role for, for Mattel, but I think it's, um, it's a really interesting space. Um, and um, I think you know, we can do a, a lot of good. Uh, I think the key for me is that we have to make sure we maintain that trust that we've built up over 70 years. Um, you know, for for us, it's about how do you create these experiences in a way that goes beyond what we're required, that goes beyond making sure, you know, the same things we've done with purely physical play, the testing we've done, uh, because if we lose the trust of parents, that's that's a bad thing, so. Sure. And I think as the FTC expresses more interest in these issues, you'll see more companies having CTOs and, and caring about this on that level. Uh, N Natasha, I, I, when I was in a public capacity, went to the, your show in Barcelona every year. By the way, if you've never been, it's awesome. Uh, it, what are your GSMA programs or that are, work on the international level? Because you know, trust and civility is a different concept around the world. What programs do you have in place right now, other than the UNICEF program that, that you had mentioned? Okay, so we work with our members um, to encourage them to adopt responsible practices and encourage children to have uh, responsible experiences online. Um, but and and we do that through sharing best practices a lot with our members and. Um, one of the things that we do, particularly outside of the sort of Europe and North America um, perspective, is um, work on capacity building and do that actually with a lot of regulators and policymakers around the world because there are a lot of people who may be working in, say, a telecoms ministry or sure. um, even in other ones who haven't really got to grasp with the sorts of issues we're talking about here and the way that people in this room do. Um, and they also, you know, fall immediately into the sort of the fear based element of that. Um, and we really want to make sure that that's balanced, that they understand the risks and what industry is doing, but also to understand the issues a little bit better. And so we run capacity building um, courses on children and mobile technology with, with them all around the world. And we've trained um, and spoken to um, a lot of policy makers in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia. Um, and we do that as a multi-stakeholder initiative. So, you know, you might see Facebook joining us with that. You might see law enforcement in that. And, and it's all about making sure that that sort of multi-stakeholder um, perspective is understood, that nobody can solve these issues on their own. And that's whether you're talking about protection or whether you're talking about participation and encouraging children, you know, learning or, um, or any of the other opportunities they'll get on the internet. So that's a big part of our work as well. Great, thank you. So Jenny, because you come from a communications background and there's been all this discussion of fake news, how do we teach our kids or even ourselves to know what sources are that you can trust or how, 
how to protect yourself from being manipulated, essentially. That's such a great question. I feel like you just read my mind about what I wanted to say listening to everybody else. First on that, I think there is a business opportunity um, and a, a really important business opportunity. Um, and you asked it when you asked the brand question for everybody. Um, people are looking for um, someone to, to, to to determine the wheat from the chaff. They're looking for a trusted person, like online when you're looking for news now. I, I've done some consulting work with the American Library Association. They have some incredible programs out there that they're teaching um, people that come into libraries how to learn the difference between fake news and real news. But when it comes to reestablishing trust in, and civility, and when you're talking about new technologies, there's a huge business interest. A, a smart business uh, is going to want to do things the right way because I think Parents and, and, and people are confronted all the time. You, you get a new product for your kid at Christmas. You don't want to have to read through all the small print and go through. You want to be able to go to a FOSI or a Common Sense, whatever. You want someone to be able to tell you that. Or you want to buy a brand that you know is not going to be selling your kids information or, or helping predators find you. So it's, it's sort of like the same thing. I think there is a real, and it, it's, it sounds cynical, but actually sometimes capital makes things happen, right? I think there's a real uh, importance in establishing a brand where you try to tell the truth as much as, as you can. Now, it's hard when the New York Times is being labeled by the president as the enemy of the state. Um, how do you go and tell somebody that doesn't have all that history? But I do think people are still looking at media writ large as sort of, or voices that are writ large, that are trusted, that, that don't let people down. They're looking more at fact-checking. Fact they're looking more for shared resources. So I think there's an, a, there's an interest in everyone's stake of, of like trying to s reliable information that people can count on, not afraid to come when you have a mistake. I mean, I think that's a big problem inside, especially when you're talking about new technologies. People will come up with something and, and they won't have thought ahead of what the problem is. And so when they come forward and say, well, wait, there could be a problem, you don't want to shut down the innovation at the same time. So that's an interesting balance that you're running into too. But I think that was a, it's a really important question. I think trusted, credentialed umpires, sort of, or people that can call the balls and strikes about products or news, that's going to become a really important field. And it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you blindly trust everything. I mean, I think there's a natural amount of cynicism. but Technology is going to help solve this problem that technology created. If that, I mean, it sounds like oh, very, I, I think they will, though. I mean, it's you, in their interest. You had Trump get elected, and then the same platform helped millions of women around the world march against him. You know what I mean? So there is, there, there are tools in there that can help on it. Um, and I don't think this, maybe those technology companies, I mean, my old bosses are probably going to kill me. They may not be able to solve it right now. Maybe it's a new startup that's going to solve it. But I think. Um, People are looking for sort of trusted brands, um, and they want. I think they're. Gonna, I think that out of chaos, sometimes there's a need for a little bit of order, not too much, but some. Sure. So, Irene, um, you know, I'm a tech optimist. I think that, that you and your organization are tech optimists, just judging by the film, the Cuba film. And I, I went to Cuba twice when, in my official capacity. That film is, is an exceptional film, and to some degree, seeing where a society has actively chosen to keep people from being online what effect that has on their capacity to grow as individuals. We forget sometimes the power, the power of technology for good as well. Uh, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between technology and democracy and technology's ability to um, empower the citizen, essentially. Yeah, and I, I mean this, what you saw in Cuba is part of a larger project, which we initiated at the beginning of this year, where we looked at five countries. We took five countries as case studies. and. Uh, it was tr our decision to do this project was triggered by the U.S. elections, and basically, and you know, as has been mentioned, uh, there were other elections where they used the technological tools to run campaigns. Uh, but what for us was really interesting is that you now have a president who communicates in a very specific way directly uh, with his voter base. So we wanted to know, you know, what is technology doing in a good and in a bad way to democracies around the world, uh, and of course, you know. Uh, we cannot really call Cuba a democracy, but we picked Cuba because you have this bottom-up approach, because people are finding their way and trying the little access they have to internet to force a government, government not to overturn the government, but to force certain changes, getting more transparency and getting the changes, ba basically modernizing the system they currently have. Uh, and in other countries, like in India, you have really have a top-down approach. 
uh, and we saw that um, every country had their own uh, problems and also their own solutions. And I fully agree with you. I think the answer to the machine is in the machine. I think the machine which is creating problems can probably also bring the solutions to these problems. Um, what, in addition to the field research, we also did online an online survey in these countries except for Cuba because we could not do an online survey because of the lack of internet and connection. And this showed that over 50% in all the other four countries, people went uh, to the online uh, outlets for their political news information. And that sometimes went up to 77, 79% just pre-election period. Uh, but in India, when we then asked the people, so, you know, this is your first source of information, do you trust it? They said, no, we don't trust the information we find online. We only trust what is in the printed media because that are kind of the trusted brands. So it's very um, uh, interesting, uh, the differences. I think we definitely will be able to create these trusted brands in, in the online environment as well. But it is about taking responsibility. I mean, that is a discussion which in Europe we have been pushing for many years. I mean, should these internet companies, what kind of responsibility do they have in comparison to uh, their offline competitors? Uh, and I think that is a discussion which will probably take up a little bit more speed now than it has, has had in the, in the last uh, few years. And to be fair, it's not the online companies. It's not, I mean, they have a platform that people use, but people are using those platforms. So I want to be, I mean, they are actually very trusted brands. Apple, Google, Amazon are some of the highest trusted brands in the country. I think politicians and some of the people in, in D.C. are wanting to, to try to take their own culpability away and put it all on the platform and not on the messenger. So I think to relate it to that, it's not, it's not just, it's easy to blame sometimes when things go wrong, the platform, and sometimes you have to blame the people that are using the platform. I thought Jason did that really well um, a second ago when you talked about, you know, their, that conversation that Stephen and Jason just had was really interesting to me about you can use, you can put bad messages out, but you can also sometimes use technology to put good. It's a balance. So I think it, it is, it has been somewhat simplified to try to blame Facebook, Google, Twitter, whatever for the fake news situation that we had, and they did have a platform that let people come on, but it was people that were pushing it and people that were reading it too. So it's an it, there's a societal tension there too. Sure, and that's a much longer yes, and very it, complicated. Can, yeah. I, I sat for 12 years on the Commerce Committee and you, many hearings. <laughs> but, and we're not we're not at an answer on, on these questions, but it is interesting the the difference in sensitivities in Europe and here. And when I was traveling in Latin America, Asia, and, and Africa, you see different different perspectives. So. Natasha, if you could talk a little bit about that sort of difference, how people are s sort of sensitive to technology in different ways around the world and, and why. Yeah, sure. So I think, um, I don't think we can even categorize it by different types of the world or even different countries because it, it, a lot of it really comes down to individuals and a lot of people take their own personal experiences and, and project that and, and talk from that. And I mean, you, you know, you hear it in conferences as well, people saying, oh, I as a parent or as a... Or, you know, or my niece or my nephew had this experience, and that initially that's what often um, kicks off some of those discussions in more public fora. Um, and so that can be that we, we, we fall in a trap sometimes of transposing that to a country that's looking at it in more ways. And that's why, you know, for us doing capacity building is also important. But then I think that the flip side of that is actually. Um, the things that actually technology companies, our, our members as mobile operators, but alongside others like Google and, and Facebook and Microsoft, empowering children to actually speak for themselves and participate in that way um, and sort of entering into it is, is, is another way of doing that. Um, and that's happening all over the world in very different ways. I mean, we had a conference earlier this week um, where Orange, who's one of our members, that's a big mobile operator in Europe, in France particularly, and in also in French-speaking uh, French countries in Africa. And they talked about what they were doing for digital literacy, so helping children learning to, to code, right? So you'd think of that in France, but this is happening in African countries, um, you know, where you, you might be thinking about them differently in terms of where they are in terms of development and children online. So they were doing coding and they were teaching kids to code in these countries and then hooking them up by video conference to each other. Um, and when we were talking about that, 
um, in some of, some of the things that were coming out, it was, it's not necessarily just teaching the kids skill, it was that participation, how excited they were to see the kid, you know, the others in other schools, in different countries, and being able to talk to them and to, you know, communicate with them and to share what they were doing. That was like, you know, transformational for some of those kids. And that's actually part of the things that, you know, we do as the industry and that can have a huge impact and maybe not today, but maybe tomorrow or next year or five years from now. Sure, and that is, that is the exciting thing about technology and its potential for being a democratizing force, yes. right? And, it, and that's really, really exciting. Sven, what kind of feedback do you get for parents? What are their primary fears and how do you address them either structurally or one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah, I think it varies um, significantly. I think the, the study this morning um, was talked about is very interesting because it, it talks about um, parents that ha have no exposure to uh, connected toys have a much higher uh, uncertainty or fear around parents that were um, exposed to them. And I think the fears, you know, are kind of all over the board, whether it's, you know, privacy or uh, privacy security, can somebody take over my device, um, you know, kind of the, the, the typical things you would think. Um, and I think, you know, when, when parents are looking at just pure digital, it's also how do I get my child off of their device and how do I get them outside to play, uh, things like that. And so I think um, for us, it really is it really is about how do we create a strong customer experience and a strong trust with parents and how do we frankly create um, toys that you know uh, that are connected but also are secure and are, are driving physical activity again versus just purely being digital so you know much of our focus is how do we create physical digital experiences so you know it gets the child off the couch or it uh, allows them to get inspired by building a cool robot or uh, allows them to learn how to code um, you know things like that that, that inspire uh, versus just kind of being you know things that just suck them in it's things that that get them to expire uh, inspired about the world around them and, and get moving moving again so Great. Um, I have a thousand other questions, but I'd like to open it up to the to the audience to see what, what questions you all have and, and involve you in the conversation as well. Are there questions out there? No hands? Okay. <laughs> um, so as we move forward, I, I think that one of the things that, that we were talking about before was, and, and that Jenny raised, is, is the idea that technology is neither inherently good nor evil. And one of the problems that, that I think that we had initially was romanticizing the internet and romanticizing technology. And now we're having to learn about essentially capacity building. How do you ensure that from a very young age people know how to interact well with, with the technology? And I, I don't know if if you could talk a little bit about whether or not you're involved in programs to help people do that or, or how it's approached in, in other jurisdictions. Yeah, well, we, we, are, uh, we are launching a program where we also will look take a closer look at how can we improve digital media literacy and what can you do so uh, from an early age uh, we access this information in a critical way, but also take the positive side of technology. I mean, you just, your question on technology and the, uh, democracy, I think it can be a great tool. You know, it's a great tool for politicians to bring citizens closer uh, to make them more participating more in, in a democratic uh, process to, in the end, do better policy making. And we have seen around the world and in Europe, there are quite some uh, political parties who have used it in a, in a very good way. I think, uh, um, I think what happened when all this kind of this first technology wave came, it was more like we saw it as a form of entertainment. You know, I can remember, and I work for the music business, you know, this was a cool way to listen to your music and get as much music as you can uh, for many people for free or, you know, when you were walking in the street and, and films. But it's much more than that. You know, I think technology is not limited uh, uh, for, for entertainment uh, uh, products. Uh, so I think we need to enter in a different phase and always ask ourselves, not what does technology to us, but what can technology do for us, uh, have a completely different approach. Uh, so we will continue to work uh, on that. Uh, we are starting, as I said, a new project uh, which will run for the next three years. Uh, our colleagues in Germany, uh, they uh, are also looking at these developments for more from an 
ethical uh, side because that is the big discussion currently in Europe. Uh, you know, uh, we need to have an ethical discussion, uh, a discussion on ethics uh, on, on technology. So, um, so I think by the end we will have probably a lot of recommendations. Jenny, I, did you have something? I was going to say, I think it's really interesting. Um, Natasha actually, s s I, it's, I was really interested to hear some of your programs, but related. I mean, there's an opportunity to teach um, sort of basic civics and engagement to kids. I mean, we, we have a lot of programs about like how to go do coding or how to, but there is some basic like communications 101 that you can make really interesting for kids. It's kind of a challenge I put out to all of you, and I'm looking at Stephen right there, but um, sort of, I mean, Sandra Day O'Connor has a foundation where she tries to sort of teach civics, um, you know, like how to go to engage with your government, but, but I would have to say, I worked at Google, they did some incredible stuff around elections, about where to find your polling place through search. Um, it was, it was really, it, it, it was, it didn't change elections by advocating one party or other, but it just gave you a sense of how easy it was for you to take part in your democratic ability to vote. Um, t you know, Twitter, you can, uh, you watch how politicians uh, monitor their Twitter feed. You can talk to your politician now without having to pay, and apologies to some of us who do this, hundreds of thousands of dollars through a lobby firm to go talk to them. You can talk to them directly through Twitter, Facebook, or, or take it from the other side. I used to have to do this rural tour for Harry Reid when I worked with him, and we'd have to drive through and there were some places where Harry Reid wasn't that popular in Nevada, and we'd have armed guards with us and march. It, it was it, it could be really stressful, but now Harry Reid doesn't have to wait twice a year or or Senator Heller or whoever to go to Elko, Nevada. You can talk to Elko, Nevada directly through video conferencing. So I think demo finding new ways to engage young people using, and again, it doesn't have to be partisan. It doesn't have to be one party in Europe, but, but there's a real ability to teach kids from a young age that you that technology is empowering. You have a voice. I mean, you have a voice because you have a phone or you have a uh, whatever, and you have to use that responsibly. And I think the second sort of related to it, and it's an interesting thought, is, is the content that you're providing. Because again, I don't think it's totally fair to say technology platforms are completely different from content. There's a lot of override, but, but people who produce content or who have ideas or who have products that they want to sell, you have a responsibility to try to use those technology platforms the right way and to teach people in that process too. I mean, I think I've learned a lot about how to use technology when I wanted to buy a product online or I've, you know, it, it, it hasn't necessarily come from a politician or a committee. So, I mean, I was really struck by what you were just saying. Yes. I was just going to say we've you know this is kind of a no-brainer, but we found, you know that that having STEM toys is boring, right? Kids don't want to unwrap and go, oh, I got a STEM toy for Christmas, right? Or they want to, um, they want fun, engaging experiences, and that's one of the the cool things about you know being new to Mattel, seven-year history of how to make fun things. Uh, if you can make fun things that also help develop and help teach and help grow those experiences in a safe, trusted way. I mean, that, that's, that's you know, a great value, right? It's a great value. And I think that concept of learning from different sources is interesting. So you, you can be learning from playing with your toys. Yeah. You can be learning you know, how to interact with things with you know, connected toys. I mean, this week I learned actually from, um, from a, a teen who was at um, the event earlier in the week um, and I think he was on the Microsoft, and I apologize to Microsoft if I get it wrong, but I think it was the Council for Digital Good, Good, which is a sort of, I think they had 15 or so teams who came together and were talking about, um, you know, how they have participation and how they can get involved. And one of the guys was there, I think uh, he was definitely under 18, I think, because he was still at school. And he was talking about being an upstander, not a bystander, when there's bad stuff going on. And, you know, I hadn't heard that before. And I was thinking, okay, I'm learning this from a teen here, and I think we can do more of that. And by encouraging um, children to get involved and young people to get involved and to speak out, even, but not to speak, not, and getting over that barrier where they, they don't want to speak out because they think, you know, the bad sort of, the bad um, abuse might come on to them if they're trying to support someone on Twitter. And one of our members, Vodafone, developed some emojis um, a year or so ago, which you can use and share um, to show sort of sympathy for people who might be being bullied or if they see a hurtful remark on, on the social media. And then by putting these emojis in, they're not you know, putting themselves in the middle of that fray, but they're showing support for people who are being hurt. And I think encouraging those sorts of things 
um, and us all learning from, from that, from, from younger people as well as from the experts is probably one of the ways to go. Great. So I'm going to open up again one more time to see if we have questions in the audience. There's a question over there. Hi, this has to do with online civility, and I'm, I'm going to um, ask you the question, Tasha. 33% um, of Australian victims of image-based abuse or, or revenge porn or non-consensual intimate er images are, are having their intimate images shared without consent over mobile phone. Um, do you know of any companies that are doing anything that, that is innovative to stop that happening in the first place, um, or even a deterrent um, for people using phones in that way to share intimate images? Um, so there are, a lot of, there are a lot of small tech companies who are touting wares that, that say that they, you know, that they can do a lot of these things. Um, and there are lots of people with different niche inventions on that. I haven't seen anything that's really, you know, a standard that uh, works across everything. Um, and I think, I mean, I think the answer is that obviously the technology is part of the solution, as we talked about before, but there's never the silver bullet. Um, and so even if some of those companies are, are working well, um, th there's always ways that, you know, things will slip through. And I think that's, that's the important bit. Um, what, what we tend to see is um, a lot of sharing of best practices is the best way to go. Um, many of our operators, and particularly in Asia, I don't know why, but um, the take-up seems to be more in Asia, but they're offering solutions for parents, but they really only, they only really help for the younger children who are on there. So I think when you're talking about teens who are getting these sorts of images shared, you know, they're not going to be, they're not going to be sitting there with a, a smartphone and taking from their parent, you know, an app that's going to protect them. So really it's about education for those sorts of ages and making sure people know what to do um, if it happens and or even how to take steps to prevent it happening from their own activities themselves, i.e. not sharing some of these things um, and supporting each other. That's, that's really, I think, the way we need to go, as well as encouraging tech solutions. But I think the ages is always a, a challenge in that side. But I think we also, I mean, I think it's very important that we teach the younger generation, but we also, I mean, people of our age, we should lead by example. Uh, and if I look my daily Twitter feed, now I think it's going down. I think the, the language, the use of language is really, you know, sometimes very questionable. Uh, and I think we need some strong role models. Uh, I have a 16 year old son and, you know, he still looks up to, to certain prominent people uh, and they have a role to play. I think that is very important. Well, just to play on that, actually, I, I have to give a shout out to Fozzie here, not just because I'm on this panel, but I have a, an 11 year old boy um, and there's sort of a rite of passage when kids in DC go from this one elementary school, they all have to take a bus to go to the junior high, the public junior high. And every parent was struggling between fifth and sixth grade about how to get a phone. And none of us had any idea about rules or things that we should be. Uh, and now, to be perfectly honest, when I was at Google and I got to hear all these great programs that Stephen and a lot of the partners in this room did, I would get people to come and speak to our PTA because I actually think you should probably start teaching digital skills like in first and second grade. These kids are using, I, they're using toys, they, they're using iPads, they're using technology. But I found resources on your website and I spread them all over Northwest DC because uh, a lot of us were like, and then I thought I was being so smart, I bought a flip phone uh, for my kid so he couldn't download stuff and then I realized that the app that I wanted to have to track his movements like <laughs> didn't work on the flip phone I'm like oh apps don't work on flip phones um, but again I started to re sort of contracts and conversations but again it's not just fuzzy I mean companies people teaching kids when you start using technology that there's certain behaviors that go in there and then rewarding from a business perspective people who uh, project good role models on how to use these platforms. That's an, that's an area that I think all the big tech companies could really do is to highlight people who use their platform. They do a lot of really good work highlighting nonprofits or small businesses, but maybe starting to highlight people that comment and use the social part of their platforms in a way could be, I mean, recognition goes a long way, you know. Um, but I know I've started to follow people who like say things that are, I just had someone tweet to me, um, the Pope. Uh, who had just a great message about poverty. They were thinking about the tax bill. Like, so they sent, you know, I mean, there, there are people, I think the Vatican actually uses social media really well. Um, 
a good example. So um, I don't know. That's my thought. I think that's a, it's a good question, Danny. They I had an idea, actually, after the discussion earlier today on Amazon. Um, it would, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if Alexa, rather than just saying, Alexa, you know, tell me the weather, if you could put on an option where it could be Alexa or whatever name you've given, and then please after. And she'd only really respond if you said please. So it would be like, <laughs> Alexa, please tell me what the weather's going to be like. Or Alexa, you know, please play this or something. And that just sort of would encourage it to happen anyway. You know Alexa's not real. <laughs> <laughs> Are there other questions? One of, one of the things that, uh, so in my previous job, I traveled the world and represented the United States uh, in bilateral and multilateral negotiations all over the world. And one of the things that, that I was just amazed by was the hunger for technology. You would go to places where people were poor, like really, really poor, and have a cell phone. Like a kid wouldn't have shoes, but you'd have a cell phone. Right, this, in, in the Cuba documentary, I think you see that no matter what governments do, there is just such a strong hunger for technology. And I was wondering a little bit, one, about one, if you see the same thing, Irene and, and Natasha, and, and two, if it, what, what, that, what that means for how we should react to this market. Uh, well, we, after we went to Cuba, uh, Sam traveled to Mozambique. Um, and there you see a, s a similar uh, story, but there's also uh, a difference. Uh, ag again, I mean, access to the mobile devices is, is not easy because the, the devices are relatively expensive uh, for these very low income families. And, but once they have access to the devices, they use it in an incredibly innovative way probably much more innovative than we are using it. Uh, so you see they kind of leap, leapfrog. Uh, and that is, is, is something which is incredibly interesting. And I'm, I'm sure you have much more, uh, more stories from around the world from, from your members. Um, yeah, we, we, have, um, we have a program called Mobile for Development, and it focuses on the use of mobile technology for people living on less than $1 a day. So really, we're talking about um, people sort of at, at the bottom of the pyramid, as they call it. And there are so many different applications of, of mobile technology which just fundamentally change people's, people's um, lives. And um, they don't need to be smartphones. I mean, these are really simple, even text-based services. So we have, we have um, we've had pilots which are now sustainable businesses, which you know, helped really rural farmers in really poor areas of the world find out the price that whatever crop they were growing was in the market, so they didn't have to spend a day and a half right. taking it in and then finding that the price was low that day. You know, they could wait till the price had come up, and then they would travel and, and sell for much better. And you know, these small sort of micro amounts of payments that differences, making huge differences. And then you have things like mobile technology enabling birth registration for children born in rural communities where there was no way of registering. And these are people who grew up without an identity because they don't have a national identity number. And they're doing that by text messages with governments. And you know, that's something, for example, Orange again is enabling. And I think there's an, over 1.7 million children have already had their births registered um, in one of the countries where they're doing that, where they would never have been registered, they wouldn't have had a formal identity. So in future, they couldn't have a bank account. They couldn't do those things. So there are so many examples of that um, which are like relevant to, to tomorrow's people, the children of today, those who are just being born, but also to their parents. The one cultural thing that I see that's very different with parents is the way they view mobile phone in countries where it's seen as such as enabler rather than you know something for fun is that they just want their children to have access it to as much. And where they, they're not even literate, if their children can learn that technology and use it, they want that to happen. So then they don't really have discussions about safety. And, and that's also something that yeah. we need to focus on because we need to introduce the concept of safety without scaring them. And that's, as you said, when we saw the, the research from this morning, when you introduce the concept that these things might, you know, there might be harms associated and people get scared and, and retreat and don't use it, you have to introduce that carefully and make sure that they, they learn about it and then at the same time learn what they can do to, to be safe and, and, and to help their children as well as they use it. Uh, we had the same experience because we traveled to rural India and you saw, you know, the people just wanted their children to have access and they 
or they have other questions in relation to these mobile devices. I also, <laughs> me personally, I thought, you know, this is great, I can track my son. Uh, but then they switch it off, you know, and everything ends. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they, uh, they take it differently. What I found really astonishing how it was used in certain African countries uh, uh, to do waste management. So they have these uh, bins which are basically uh, connected. And once they're full, there's a sensor, and then they know that they have to come. Uh, the city authority, they know that they need to come and empty them. Uh, so which, you know, helps prevent a lot of problems and a lot of diseases. So uh, you see absolutely some fantastic uh, stories when you travel around the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, I'm not, so if you, if you have a question, please speak up at any time. I think we have a couple more minutes. Uh, so b before I close, I think that because the, the topic here is the Family Online Safety Institute, we are talking a lot about what people's concerns are with technology which is legitimate, there are legitimate concerns. I do worry a little bit about fear-based public policy and response. Um, and I'm wondering, because I, I worked in government for a long time, government wants to do something. We don't, or I'm not we anymore, but we didn't want to just sit idly by while technology happened to society. So if you could, just from each of you, what you think government could do positively to help us solve these challenges as a community and not have fear-based public policy, starting with Irene. Um, well, I would not say per se regulation because I think there are many different uh, other solutions uh, uh, than regulations, but I think governments can help in raising awareness. Um, and I think, you know, either at national level, uh, me coming from Europe at European level, I think there is definitely a role uh, governments can play. Uh, and then trying to get everybody on board, civil society, uh, local communities and, and industries, getting everybody around the table. Right. I actually think that's a really important point. It actually came up in our panel earlier today, but the convening role of government is really important. I mean, you can't sometimes get people around the table or people may not ever meet each other unless they're sort of brought together by government, maybe because they're fearing that the government would do something or government just wants to have a, a conversation about it. I also think that, um, government systems themselves um, could use a little technological refresh too. And I think that comes from uh, lack of resources. I mean, we talked today in our panel about, uh, you know, if you look at the special needs community and, and how big that is globally with all the different kinds of concerns and family members, like government could be using technology in ways to do preventative medicine or could be used technology. I mean, we've all done, the Obama administration actually did a lot of this. I was at HHS for a while. but. Um, I think that, I think sort of honoring people that do good things, highlighting them, using their power of the bully pulpit, I think convening, and then I think looking for ways to do innovative, I mean, government needs to resell itself to people too. It's pretty clear if you look globally. Um, so, uh, you know, how can they tell their stories about how they're using technology to change people's lives and recognize efficiencies and save taxpayer dollars? Okay. So, um, I agree. I mean, I think awareness raising and education is key, and I think governments need to educate themselves as well and their own staffs a little bit more within that. And then I think within the, within the support that they give to schools in particular, um, I think, you know, a bit of a refresh on there. So we're not, so the, the children or kids, young people aren't just going into a class to learn how to be online safety, but, you know, balance that with the opportunities and, and get it more integrated so that they're learning about being safe, but not as just as, as itself, so they're learning through another mechanism. They're learning about how to study online, and as part of that, they learn the safety bit within it, rather than now you're gonna learn about online safety and now go back to your normal subjects. Let's get it into the normal subjects and let's do it in through that. that that's what I would encourage um, governments who have already you know, started to put into digital literacy into schools. Yeah, I have to agree, and going last is easy on this one. I, um, I think this space is so difficult to regulate. I mean, creating frameworks around this, um, experiences are very different depending on what you're doing with technology. The experiences online are very different, but then connected products, experiences, and you know, IoT and tablets are extremely different. So I think bringing the communities together, I think, I, I think companies have to have a passion for creating safe, 
uh, compelling experiences for their customers, and they have to have a passion for continuing to be trusted providers. And if companies do that and government comes together with them, I think we can figure out solutions versus, um, you know, GDPR is, is, is troubling just because it's confusing. There's so much out there. It's hard to even make sense of it. And so, you know, I think, um, I think we can come together and figure out great solutions that, that make it safe uh, for kids uh, with toys and, and for folks online. Well, great. With that, I think we're going to close the panel. I want to thank the Family Online Safety Institute again, and thank you all very much for sitting with us. Take care.